but I did start my career in Eastern Europe. I moved to Czechoslovakia just a few months after the fall of communism, and I was working as a journalist. And my brief was to tell people in the West, my Western readers, what people in the East were all about, how they thought, how they lived, what their aspirations and dreams were. And these were two parts of Europe that had been divided since 1945. And the iconography I was up against was very powerful, was this, was John le Carré, Tinker Taylor, all over the place, godless communists and you name it. So the tool I had at my disposal to tell a different story was journalism. I would interview people, collect quotes, package them into articles, send them off to my editors in London and Berlin. Effective? That was a very frustrating exercise because at the end of the day, it wasn't my voice. It was only, it wasn't their voice, it was my voice. I was filtering their voices. It was not um, what I was hearing. I couldn't pass it on. I could only pass it on through the filter of my personal experiences. So that's when I started off on a quest for a different tool. I felt that journalism wasn't enough. I could not communicate effectively and really um, make people hear what people were saying. So, fast forward 20 years to a very different revolution. This is a visualization of the Twitter sphere during the uprising in Egypt in January 2011. This is, um, it's about those people who tweeted under the hashtag Jan25. I don't know if any of you uh, were on Twitter during the Arab Spring. And so the red dots are those who uh, tweeted in Arabic. And the larger the tweet, the more they tweeted. And, and the blue dots are those who tweeted in English. And so this time, the story found me. I didn't, have out get out, I didn't have to go out there and find the story. And the story has a name. Her name is Lina Benmeni. Lina is the poster child behind the revolution in Tunisia. She is the only blogger who went to the south of the country in January 2011 to um, Sadi, Sidi Bouzid and, and Kasserine and took pictures of corpses on the street to document that Ben Ali was attacking his people, not only in Tunis, but also in the south of the country. And she was the only person who drew the attention of the international community to the fact that this was happening. And Lina is a woman. She's, uh, she was in mid, her mid-twenties at the time. She was a, an assistant professor at the University of Tunis. She taught English and is, it's really, an incredible uh, achievement on her part to have done this. And so Lena was, I, I came across Lena on Twitter. One um, very dark afternoon in December in London, I sent out a tweet. I was um, working with uh, Bent at the European Training Foundation. Uh, we started off on a project to connect women bloggers in the Middle East and to create a network online that would help them tell their stories. So I didn't have a clue. I didn't have any contacts in the Middle East. I just had a hunch that that would work. So what I did was I sent out a tweet and it was passed on and eventually six months after the Arab Spring I got to Lena. And, and so we started talking, we linked Lena with other women so that they could talk to each other through social media and then the rest of history is history. The Arab Spring came and Lena became an international celebrity. She was um, featured on CNN, on BBC, on Al Jazeera, and then what happened next is truly amazing. Just think that the way I got in contact with this lady, um, the way 
we were able to tell her story at the European Training Foundation was through one single tweet. Next thing is, Lena was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, this is, for me and for Bent and for Joe, this was one of the best days in our life. Because it's just, we were able to tell a story, we were able to empower her voice, not through a lame article, not through traditional journalism, but by linking her voice through that of other women, through social media, through a network. So this is um, really, this is the power of social media. This is what have, we have to keep in mind. This is truly happening. And so the Arab Spring, of course, was not just about women rights. As the ambassador yesterday said, communication sets people free. And um, this is a study by the uh, Dubai School of Government, which shows that during the Arab Spring, the fact that the government blocked the internet, did not deter people from, go from demonstrating, from joining the demonstrations, from joining in and, and rebelling. So you know, this, on this chart, this shows that in Tunisia, when they blocked the internet, about 60% of the people, they felt even more motivated. And this was a country where people were afraid, where people were not used to, to speak their mind. And, and so we can see what's happening these days in, you know, humanity is undergoing an acceleration. And we can see here, this is what happened during the Arab Spring. In, uh, in one month, um, in January, they blocked the internet in Egypt. And uh, just so, you know, the government um, just tried to prevent people from using the internet to organize demonstrations. And only one month later, they gave in. The uh, military council recognized that they did have to engage with citizens, otherwise it would become very, very serious. So this took just one month. What in Eastern Europe took decades, and a lot of suffering and a lot of tears, it took one month. And so you can see what is happening, and you can see that this is very real. So for us communicators, how does this translate into what we do? A lot of people tell me, yeah, but Sylvia, you know, this isn't the corporate world, this is politics, and these people have always fought, and this works for them, it doesn't work for us. So I, um, of course, I work in commu corporate communications, and I just wanted to uh, get a sense of whether this is true or whether change is also happening where we work. And it is. Um, as Robert Medlin was saying yesterday, we are co-creating change. This we, companies are recognizing that these tools are important, that they have to give a voice to their people. And it might be the recession, it might be that you know, we need to cut costs, or it might just be the spirit of the time. It, must be, it might be that it's just spilling over from you know, the world that surrounds us to the world where we work. And um, so chance is that you know, when, we, when we will meet again in two years' time for the next Eurocom, internal social media, social media in the enterprise won't just be something you know, that we talk about. It will be something that you know, is, is real, that we are really doing. And it's really, as, again, as Robert was saying yesterday, it is co-creating change. It is working together to create a new way of communicating, a new way of doing work. So um, let's have a look at where it all started. We began with the Industrial Revolution where we were connecting physical strength to produce goods. Then we moved on to the um, IT revolution where we were producing and distributing data. And now we are dealing with a very different revolution. We are connecting the powers of networks to create a new way of working. And the way 
to think about this is the difference is to think about the difference between Encarta and Wikipedia. Encarta was an encyclopedia that was created by Microsoft to, you know, they, they were going to sell it to whoever wanted to buy it. Da, another piece of software, exciting. <laughs> Wikipedia is something that is created by networks, by people who care about it, who, by people who share passion and values and would spend hours you know, the, on, uh, on the, during the weekends, uh, after uh, work, to, to write about what they really care about. So it is the power of those networks, the power of those dynamics that will create the new way of working, that is changing the structure of, our, of the organizations we work for and therefore is changing the way we communicate. So to uh, give you an idea of, um, well, of course, and, and you know, it's changing all sorts of processes, it's changing procurement, internal social media, it's changing procurement, it's changing IT, it's changing HR. So we could talk all day about that. And I thought I would, of course, focus on something that is very relevant for us, which is communications. And I chose an example um, from the financial sector because that's where I'm coming from. I'm a former financial journalist for all my sins. But also, it's, it's an example from Italy. And for those of you who know the fin Italian financial sector, sector, they'll know what I'm talking about. It's one of the most conservative environments you can think of. And by the way, I grew up partially in the country of love, Austria, but I, ca I come from the real country of love, which is Italy. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, but first, before I talk about that, I'll, I would like to focus on an idea, and this is a core idea. I think this is what we really need to understand in order to understand how communications is changing. In the past, we would produce text. We would produce text, and that was it, and our job was done. Now, and this is a great quote by Bob Pearson, who used to work for Dell and wrote a book that I can highly rec recommend, pre-e-commerce. He wrote that these days, communicators have to write text, have to produce um, content, rather, that is produced half by the company and half by the stakeholder, half by the um, employee, half by, the, by a regulator, by a journalist, by a stakeholder. So what he means is, let th let's think of a blog. When you write a post, we write it, we write, you know, we put in it what we think, our ideas, but the job is not done. That's only 50% of the story. The other 50% is, what is that? Come on. Pardon? Customers, comments, right, comments. The other part is comments, reactions, likes, shares. That has to happen. If that doesn't happen, we have failed. So do keep this in mind you know, for your future work and as I go along with, with my little talk today, because this is the dynamic, this is the future, this is the quintessential idea that explains how our job as communicators is changing. So, now my example. Paolo Cederle is the CEO of a company that sells services, back office services, to one of the largest banks in Europe, Unicredit. He's got 40,000 employees and he want, wanted to write a blog. Have you ever been asked by your leader to write a blog? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, um, that can be a scary process. And this was initially a scary kind of going nowhere process. So, you know, he started writing a blog and it was very corporate and it sounded like a memo and blah, blah. I've been to a meeting and a big yawn and but then um, things changed, and they changed thanks to this post. So in this post, Paolo started writing about how his life changed because his daughter left home to go live abroad. Uh, and if you grew up in Italy and you have Italian parents and you decide to go live abroad, you know what I mean. And, um, and so um, 
they, you know, he wrote about something very personal. And actually, I showed this slide in a financial institution. I was doing a training, and they were shocked. They said, oh my god, no, 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 you can't do this. You can't, you know, this is highly unprofessional. And you can't speak about, you know, your private life. And your private life is one thing, and your professional life is another. So um, he did this, and then uh, you know, he talked about you know, the, experience, the, the experience of his family going through profound change. And then he moved on to a more uh, corporate subject. He introduced a corporate subject, saying, well, that's change at personal level, but you know, how about change at corporate level? Which lessons can we draw from that? And see, what is happening here is he's using the authentic touch and personal voice to introduce a corporate subject. And for us communicators, this sounds very, you know, da, yes, that's what you do. But in an environment like this, this is enormous change. This is light years. Okay, so that's 50%. That's 50%, you know, done pretty well. It worked. Why did it work? It worked because he'd got comments. And he got comments, and this is one of them, and uh, we kept it as it is. We didn't edit it, we didn't do the English. That's also an important part of it. And so this, this person says, um, you know, it's, change is important and not just for the sake of change. And um, so this is quite revolutionary in a culture where you don't really question your leadership. They never did. And, and then um, also, I, I was talking to someone who comments on Paolo's blog. And, um, you know, Bl Paolo is very good. He always gets back to people. He replies to the comments. And so I was uh, talking to somebody who, you know, uh, interacts with Paolo on, on Paolo's blog. And he told me, you know, the day Paolo a reply to a comment of mine. I've been working in this bank for many years. That's w the first time I felt like a human being in this bank. So as the ambassador said yesterday, um, co real communication f uh, sets people free. And this is what it, what's happening. So another example I wanted to share with you is from Unilever, um, a company I've been working with. So, well, Unilever is a sustainability champion, and what they do is they, they produce a sustainability report every year, and they send, used to send it out to their stakeholders. Again, blah, big yawn. Everybody does that. But what they decided to do yet last year is they decided to, instead of you know, doing that, they decided to do a, w a web jam. So they... Um, you are you familiar with the web jam? So basically what you do is you invite people on to, a, to join a community online and you conduct conversations uh, for 24 hours. In this case, it followed the sun. It started in the east. It, um, it finished in, in North America. It started in, on, you know, in the early morning of the 25th of April and ended in the early morning of the 26th of April. And so what they did is they, they had, you know, uh, streams and conversations and, and different feeds and people could you know jump in and 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 talk uh, to other people and leave comments and and their CEO would also comment uh, you know from time to time uh, getting back to people interacting with them and so for a big company like this it's it's a very very big step because of course you know you're exposed you are you're there online, people can say what they think, you have very little time to react, but they recognize that this is the spirit of the time, that this is where you need to go. And so they, um, you know, the advantage of this is also that your stakeholders drive the agenda. So these are all topics that you know, surfaced during the conversations. It was their stakeholders who told them what they wanted to talk about. It wasn't them sending a lame report out. That maybe the report wasn't lame, it was just a process which was sending it out and, and sort of waiting for reactions. So um, Phil and everybody, this is the story of my life which started with one revolution 
And the tool I had at my disposal during that revolution, immediately after that, was not very satisfactory. The second revolution I experienced in my life was very different. There I found a tool and it was an amazing experience. And now I am very fortunate to be working what I believe will be the next revolution. And uh, so my appeal to you is please do join in as communicators. It is a cause that is very, war very well worth fighting for. Thank you.